Good evening, everyone. It's pretty late. Um, I thought I would uh, do a video. I'm, my goal is to do a video a day, and particularly on the weekdays. And I had been very busy today, but I decided I'd do it at a little bit of a different time. Some of you may be in bed, or some of you may be uh, overseas just waking up. But I wanted to um, continue the discussion I had had a few days earlier, where I did an analysis, if you remember, of uh, Britain, uh, the British actually crown. I did a deeper analysis on looking at how the British crown uh, during its colonial era, be it in India or be it in the United States or be it in Ireland, carried out a brutal uh, policy of oppression. But I want to look at the other side of that, which is um, apparent today, which is really how the British royalty, or for that matter, the elites, have a very powerful vehicle for propaganda, particularly through the uh, through the vehicle of movies and shows um, to brainwash people. And uh, yesterday, I believe over the weekend, I think it was yesterday or Saturday, I did a post on my Facebook page talking about the launch of this uh, new version of a show called Downton Abbey. And um, I, I shared the contradiction of how that show um, essentially whitewashes all the class contradictions. And um, essentially the big elephant in that room is the fact that the servants who are portrayed in there are made to appear that they're all you know, friends with the royalty and everything works out. And meanwhile, as we'll share with you, the show um, has won many, many awards on its historical accuracy and how well um, they pay attention to detail. And um, so I did that post and, then, and you can go look at it and there's some very interesting dialogue there. A few people said, hey, uh, very few, most people got it. Uh, a few people said, hey, this is just a show, you know, it's just entertainment. So that's why the title that I did of this is Downton Abbey, not just a show but it's royal and deliberate propaganda. And that's what we want to discuss. And some of you may know, I've lived out in Hollywood, you know, I've had my relationships there. Um, and most of the people there who want to be celebrities have very little talent and not to say that there are not some very extraordinary talented people, but they're few and far between. But by and large, the strata people live out there and you can do your own investigation um, beyond my personal experience, essentially have golden handcuffs. Now, one of the things that needs to be understood is any show or movie that makes it to mainstream doesn't get there because it's just a good show, okay, or it just has talented people. It gets there because they have to achieve one very powerful, uh, or they have to execute on one very powerful uh, part, which is distribution, 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 distribution. So there are a lot of talented people out there. There are a lot of uh, people who make great movies, great songs, uh, great art. But you notice that there's this whole body of stuff that, that's out there. And then there's a very subset, a very, very small, small, razor thin um, set of stuff that actually gets distributed. And this distribution needs to be understood or people are naive. So when Downton Abbey gets out there, it didn't just get out there because it has, had, it has some very good writers and very good actors, but that's not the reason. It got out there because of distribution. Um, several years ago, um, I did a movie uh, that was produced by Pierce Brosnan, his wife directed it, and I was the main scientist in, in that movie, uh, which won many, many awards. And uh, it was really on exposing GMOs and Monsanto. And Pierce uh, Brosnan put his, you know, he sort of put himself out there because he produced it. And even with his name brand equity as one of the best James Bonds, it got zero distribution, even though it won all the awards, great film, okay? And you can find it out there, it's called Poisoning Paradise. But the point is that Great movies, great art, great documentaries don't just get out there. They get out there if the distribution occurs, okay? Well, you have people like Harry Weinstein, you know, who used to uh, control 
uh, this kind uh, kind of distribution, right? Um, and there's a very finite set of people who control this distribution, and things don't get distributed unless they serve the purpose of those in power. So art um, serves political reasons, and you have to appreciate that it's not just great art gets out there. You have to be part of the clique. It's very, very rare that stuff gets out there because it just happened to make it through. So Downton Abbey, the point I'm making is for it to get out there, for it to get all this uh, popularity, et cetera, is because some people wanted it out there. And those some people are not you or I, they're people with incredible amount of wealth and power. Okay. So just keep that in mind. That's the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make is that the premiere just took place, I think this past week. And uh, it's funny because I looked at some of the people out there and you can see, I'll show you pictures of this. Most of the people who are part of the premiere, who went to the party and the after party, many of these people are who, who think they're the most awoken people, right? They're the ones or talking about quote unquote Black Lives Matter, or they're talking about, you know, the Me Too movement and et cetera, or how much they're against child trafficking, et cetera. And let me show you, um, you know, sort of the scene. So this was the Downtown Abbey, you know, premiere, you know, um, and, and you can see sort of the shindig here of people all getting dressed up. It looks literally like out of the twenties, you know, um, same time, that it, very similar to what we're living now, a uh, lot of class contradictions, um, people, you know, uh, having serious economic issues, but then you have one branch of the elites who are out there getting dressed up like this and attempting to make everyone, quote unquote, feel good, right? And so this was, you know, the people, the actors and the actresses, and you can see there's a, uh, there was an event and then there's big after party after this. And again, many of these people knowingly, these are very political people, you know, who are partying out there, having a grand time on a piece of culture, quote unquote, art that they are creating, all of these people, um, that they know that it's about royalty, it's about promoting royalty, they've read the script, and they know that this script and anyone who actually sees it has any historical context knows that the script has nothing to do with reality yet. Yet, as you'll see, as I share this, all these people partying out there who claim that they're for the masses and want to work for you and I, um, et cetera, um, are part of a money-making machine, this Downton Abbey, which actually completely ameliorates any of uh, the, the, the real big elephant is how they uh, are completely inaccurate about the way servants were actually treated. Now, so again, to those of you who, who small minority who think this is just um, uh, a show, let me just point out that um, this, this show's won a lot of awards. And one of the reasons it won a lot of awards is because they said how historically accurate it was, okay? And let me show you that. And this is just a few, um, some of those things. So here's an article that came out. It says in uh, Citizen Times, it says, uh, Downton Abbey, you know, uh, a meat who keeps Downton Abbey historically accurate. And it's talking to the guy, apparently, this guy, Darren Papara, who's the chief curator. Um, and he was hired to actually keep this very accurate. And he's so proud of himself, how accurate that he keeps the show. And uh, he says, you know, he makes sure, um, you know, people, he goes, the documentaries from Alistair Bruce, the historical advisor for show, okay? Um, uh, you could also call him the shoulder police. Part of his duties, he describes, is to watch the actors and make sure they keep their backs straight and tall. And he says, all the time, I watch to make sure actors and actresses don't do modern things like slouch. He said later, nothing that we all spend so much time bent over computers and phones that we slouch so much more than these characters would in the 20th century, I keep an eye on their demeanor, okay? And then he goes on to say that he also makes suggestions about the set and the movements of characters. For instance, he will note that a servant at an estate in that era would not exit the home through the door, 
noted in the script in the new season bruce jokes said he was unpopular after he was particularly stubborn about a blanket okay so anyway this article is about this guy how he maintains make sure that the servants you know and, and their interaction with the the other characters are done to historical accuracy let me show you another one and this is another one an article that came out in the list which talks about why downton abbey producers didn't allow costumes to be washed during filming and it's about how they try to maintain accuracy and it says aside from the talent cast of brilliant writing downton abbey has received praise for its historically accurate period costumes okay the costumes are so popular in fact that they ended up being celebrated in an exhibition per the downton uh, exhibition official and it says according to gentlemen's gazette the show worked with four costume designers through the six series to oversee historical accuracy through anna robbins is cited most often when talked about the clothing downton abbey and it goes here to say to maintain the authenticity of certain vintage costumes they were rarely washed okay point being that this show claims that they hired experts to make sure the servants uh, were interacting right, that the clothes were accurate, et cetera. And you have this award-winning show, which gets a lot of plays, made a lot of money, and with this movie coming out, and again, understand that this would not occur without distribution. So it's absolute naivete to think that these movies and shows just make it on their own. They make it because there's a lot of money behind it, and there's an agenda behind it, okay? But if um, I've never actually seen a full version of the show, but my significant other watches the show all the time. And I actually got interested in this because I saw this event take place. And I know some of the foolish people go to these events. And what I then saw at the same time as I was seeing this take place was I saw uh, a book that came out on the on the same occasion of the show and i'm going to share with you that book okay that book was this book that came out and let me bring it here and the book is called it was, it was a review came out of the book which just came out um and the and the book and the review was what downton abbey doesn't show you the dark side of life as a servant in britain's mansions the book not in front of the servants it was the title of the book reveals what it was really like to be a maid in the UK backbreaking work, No Free Time and Cruel Masters. Now, what the book talks about is there was, there was a guy by the name of um, uh, um, uh, Frank Victor Dawes, okay? And Frank Victor Dawes was a British journalist in 1872. He published an ad in the Daily Te Telegraph back, sorry, 1972, and he asked people who had worked as servants to send him letters recounting their experiences, okay? in these British households. And he got lots and lots of letters, people writing, and one of them was uh, this person, Harriet Brown, who wrote, you know, I am up at half past five and, and six every morning and do not go to bed till nearly 12 at night. And I feel so tired, so I'm, sometimes I'm obliged to have a good cry. And, and he shares in this book, which he launched at the same time as people were partying out there, what the real reality was. And for example, he talks about in the book, he goes, this image is far from the experience of Elizabeth Simpson, born in 1853, who also began working as a maid at the age of 10, okay, child labor, in a mansion in the country of Yorkshire. As her granddaughter told Dawes, she had to get up at 4 a.m., so it's a 10-year-old girl, to scrub the stone floors of the dairy with cold water, churn butter until her arms ached. At those early hours, she worked by the light of a single candle, which she pushed ahead of her as she moved across the stone flags on her knees. She was kept working all day under the rules of the mansion, which were strictly enforced. She was never to be seen by any of the family. If by some mischance they happened to meet, she was not to talk to them by curtsy and disappear as quickly as possible. Okay. So Dawes really talks about what took place. And he apparently got 700 different letters in a space of months of people really sharing what, what it was really like to be in these, you know, in the Downton Abbey type environment. And um, he also talks about the fact that, um, you know, women were essentially completely abused in these environments and how, you know, the religious order of the time uh, try to uh, 
say how both servant and master were fed the idea that their position in life responded to divine order. So essentially, they use religion or the Bible to try to say that it was okay to be screwed over and be a slave. Um, and but one of the most important things that Dawes found was, you know, how these servant people were treated, right? He goes uh, in terms of, um, you know, uh, how they were mistreated by the masters. He goes, as for the servants and women of lower classes, they all fornicated in secret and were proud to have a gentleman to cover them. That was the opinion of men of my lifestyle and my age, recounts a Victorian gentleman in his memoirs, which he published. If, as happened all too often, a servant girl became pregnant by one of the family, the blame was squarely based on her shoulders, not his, writes Dawes. Often these women are fired without reference, which left her for the alternative um, of the workhouse or prostitution. So anyway, as these actors and actresses are partying away, which was last week, you know, in New York and Britain at this launch, all of the quote unquote Me Too they have forgotten the elephant in the room about the actual treatment of women, these women servants. And so why is this being done? So you have to ask, why is this being done? So how does a film like this make it go back to, to follow the money and follow the political agenda? A movie like this does not make it until, unless it has a political agenda, okay? If it serves money making and a political agenda, it's a, you know, it's, it's a grand slam. So if you think about, and you step back and you think about the British elite, and I, I did this in a video when I talked about um, how Britain mistreated the Irish and colonialism, the uh, people of the American colonies and people of India. And you really look back, the British royalty really had nothing when you, in terms of resources. Britain is a very small country, and yet they were able to dominate the world. And you have to really ask, how do they do that? When Britain, as I mentioned, went to China to trade, the Chinese said, what are you talking about? This is in the you know, 16, 1700s, they had nothing. When they came to India, India at the time, 25% of the wealth of the world came out of India, textiles, gold, spices, et cetera. Britain had really nothing to trade. So the only way Britain was able to succeed was through one vehicle. One word epitomizes this brutality, sheer brutality, pure evil, just brutality. And you recognize, I mean, I just saw a movie, uh, John, what was that movie you saw with Michael Collins? John, what was that movie we saw with Michael Collins? It was literally called Michael Collins. Oh, so their movie called Michael Collins. And the movie <laughs> is about um, the guy who started the I Irish Republican Army and he was shot and killed when he was 31. But you see in the movie, there's a scene, which is another bloody Sunday, where the British just go into a soccer stadium and just mow down people, unarmed people, exact same thing that they did in India. And so if you think about the psychology, somebody among the elite said, look, we really have nothing. We don't have really much arable land. We only have one growing season. We don't really have any resources, so how are we going to dominate the world? Brutality. Sheer freaking brutality. There is no other way. So you basically cross a line. You know, you become absolutely brutal. And so when you look at a country like India, the wealth that it had, and I'm not saying this because I come from an Indian American background. If anything, I'm more American. I look at what occurred to the American col colonists. They fought back in a very powerful way, which I have great uh, regard for. And then finally, it took a, a bit of time for people in Ireland to fight back. But it was through brutality that the British elites still succeed. They're still poking the bear. They're the ones who have started this war between Ukraine and Russia. They're the ones who started World War I, World War II. They always drag everyone else into wars. It's through brutality and domination thinking the British royalty, I'm not talking about the British people who get screwed also as a part of this, are the only people who should dominate the world. And that has not ended. And the essence of the British royalty is to not only use brutality, that's one arm, but the other is pure propaganda and brainwashing. So through brutality and brainwashing, 
is how the British royalty or the royalty succeed. So what is the brainwashing? The brainwashing is to always ameliorate class differences while they actually practice massive class war between a small set of elite against the rest of us. And that is what occurred during the overt feudalism. A very small set of people used to subjugate masses of people. Today, we have a neo-feudalism. We have a modern feudalism. And it's a set of billionaires who are essentially obliterating the rest of the world. And no one wants to talk about this. No one wants to talk about what's going on to working people in the United States, globally, in Britain, all over the world. But I want to remind you of a couple of things that are taking place that's important to understand. Just some facts that's occurring right now. And that's why I say this show is being promoted because it, if you actually analyze the show, they, they basically almost democratize all of this. Oh, the servants and the royalty, they all get along and they, it's one big happy freaking family. It's not true. The reality, if they were truly historically accurate, they would have done the accuracy to the way the servants actually were, 10 year olds being treated as slaves, women being treated as prostitutes. And yet you have all these women glamorizing this freaking show, which generates hundreds of millions for them and their advertisers, and also serves a political agenda to take us, the masses, and people who watch it to make them feel good as though we're all one big fucking happy family. It's not true. Let's look at the reality to show what's going on. Here's some facts, okay? 70% of Americans in the Pew report told, you know, felt that the next generation will be worse off than their parents. That's 70%. And this is not just the masses. Now, young people across the country, and this comes you know, from the analysis of uh, uh, Joel Klotkin, who, who, who did a deep analysis on this, and he looked at the Pew Report. Young people across the country are pessimistic as well. Most people, 15 to 24, also think that their life will be worse for them than their parents. So think about what we're saying. We're saying that 70% of Americans are convinced that the next generation will be worse off than their parents, and people 15 through 24 think they're going to be worse off than their parents. So that's the mindset of where people have come to. So a show like Downton Abbey is intended to re-brainwash people or brainwash people away from that reality. And th these are the results. Okay, this is a reality. To sh the share of American adults who live in middle-income households, middle-income households, has decreased from 61% in 1971 to 51% in 2019. So that's 10%. It's almost 30 million people, okay? And the pandemic appears to have accelerated this pattern, hitting low-income workers hardest while the recovery helped them the least. Meanwhile, at the top are raking it in. CEO compensation reached record levels. Investment bankers on Wall Street enjoyed record bonuses. And the giant tech firms now boast a market cap greater than the bloated federal budget. And as uh, Klotkin says, as millions struggle to fill their tanks to pay their rent, sales of business jets to the rising ranks of billionaires have soared to great heights. So um, you have this explosive class difference taking place in the United States. You can look at it not only in the US, in every country. So isn't it very nice to have a show come out like this, if which, which basically says, you know, the servants and the royalty, you know, they're all sort of get along. It's all, you know, they're one big happy family. Yeah, there's little soap operas here, but it does not show the brutality of how the maids were treated. In fact, you have to understand maids were treated so bad that they weren't even allowed to participate in workers' movements because even the work, they were even below the workers. Okay. That's what's interesting. All right. So these shows, these shows are not just entertainment. And I'm not just, you know, someone I think wrote on the Facebook post, oh, you know, this is just how things were in those days. You know, people were treated like slaves. The point is, you're right. But the show doesn't show that. The show purposefully hides that, but wins awards on its historical accuracy. 
when it's not historically accurate. It's deliberately propaganda by omission. And that's what I hope all of you take away. What I hope you take away is to recognize that A, these shows that make it big like this achieve it because they have to get distribution. You, I'm sure there's a lot of talented people listening out there. Many of you could probably have written great shows or maybe you have a great movie or script, but it's about distribution. And this distribution is not uh, decided by the greatness of the show. It's decided by what agenda it will serve. It is like big pharma selling something to generate capital for them, but to perpetuate their existence. Well, here the elites are gonna generate money by people watching these shows, but it perpetuates their exi existence because it ameliorates the actual class differences that are taking place. That's why this show is pure propaganda. It's brainwashing. And you and what's and everyone should be frankly angry at this. These people go party. They talk about their woke, Me Too, Black Lives Matter. Yet they make profit from shows, win awards, win Oscars of a show that actually does not bring about the brutality of what took place to the women servants of the time. And that's what we need to understand. And this is why we need to look at all of this from a system standpoint. These shows don't exist in a vacuum. These shows are being played. Remember, this show was called Upstairs, Downstairs. It was around on PBS in the 70s. It was actually a little more accurate then. But by the time, and, and, and you know, the PBS crowd in the 70s was, you know, sort of your educated scholarly people would watch it. But now they've taken the show and ameliorated these class differences to make it a consumer product so everyone will consume it and feel good. Feel good that they're being screwed over, but there is everything is fine. Let's we're all one big freaking happy family. So that's what this is about. Okay. This is real, yes, lifetime plus 70 years after someone said this, lifetime plus 70 years after a slavery for the entertainers. Yeah. So the entertainers, they, they themselves um, are part of this, right? Because remember, very, very few people among the entertainment community really have any talent who actually trained and worked hard, et cetera. 99% of them prostituted themselves, slept with the right people, had very little talent, are celebrities. Celebrity is very different than a consummate actor. And a consummate actor making that is very, very rare. Okay? So these shows are distributed, they're promoted, they serve a political agenda. So in a nutshell, Downton Abbey serves the agenda to brainwash people. Everything is fine among all of us. We're all one big happy family, yet we're seeing this explosive class differences. That's why it's propaganda. And what I want to share with everyone is how do we, so I, I've given the analysis. Um, and the, the reason I give this analysis is sure, go watch the show if you like it, you know, but recognize what you're watching is it's like taking an aspirin, you know, or taking a drug to make you forget stuff. That's what you're really doing. But if you're taking it to think it's just entertainment, I want to wake you up to the reality. It's not just entertainment. It is propaganda. But if you're aware it's propaganda, then you will observe it as propaganda and you'll see it for what it is. And then maybe you can, as you're being entertained, you'll know that you're being entertained and you won't let it brainwash you. And what's the solution? Well, the solution that you recognize is that we have to see things as they are. We have to build a bottoms up movement, but most importantly, we have to educate, educate, educate. Those in power have incredible, incredible power and foothold on media, the educational system, the mainstream educational system. And my view is the way out of this is for us to take a systems approach to understanding everything, to learning to think beyond left and right as a scroll bar I'm doing. So it would be one thing for me to do these analysis and critiques, but it would be wrong if I didn't offer a solution. And the solution that I've come up with is over the last 50 years, as someone who is who grew up in a caste system in India, as an untouchable caste, understood this and had a deep love of science, 
over the last 50 years I've integrated to discover a curriculum that anyone in the planet can understand and do this kind of systems analysis. So we go beyond left and right. We see, see things as they are. So that over the last you know, five or seven years, I've put together a curriculum which we've made accessible, which you can actually A, understand the science of systems, B, connect with other people globally so you can at least feel like you have a group of people who can talk about politics or health or education from a beyond left and right view. We've created a whole technology platform for that. And then C, for you guys to connect together as warrior scholars to actually go educate others, a learn, teach, and serve model. So I hope the analysis I do, the videos I do, you know, I hope they're educational, but I hope it compels you to want to take responsibility and to learn the science of systems, which you can't really get anywhere else unless you pay lots and lots of money. I've made it accessible to everyone. So you get a scholarship so you can study it and you can give it away to your kids and children. And, and that's what the world needs right now. We need to awaken working people to see things as they are so we don't get brainwashed. And that is, was my real reason in doing this. I mean, you can do this on a number of other uh, shows. Downton Abbey is an excellent example because it really tries to ameliorate these class contradictions. So I hope you take advantage of that. I hope you um, recognize that we need to build a bottoms up movement. And I hope all of you go take the systems course and recognize where we are at as a world that um, those in power are very, very clever through politicians, through dividing us into left and right, or ameliorating these class differences to make, and make it lull us into uh, a sleep. So I hope you guys uh, uh, enjoyed this and do your own analysis. Watch these shows. Yes, sure, go get entertained, but understand what you're watching, that by the time it hit mainstream media and got out there, it had to go through a lot of vetting and a lot of censoring and a lot of political agendas to get it out there. And when you see these actors and actresses who claim they're for you and are part of this and know that it's not historically accurate, you have to recognize that they're basically celebrities. They're not really actors and they have golden handcuffs and they're basically prostituting themselves and they frankly have very little ethics for true art. Art is a movement of the time, as someone said, and ultimately great art reflects the actual time. It doesn't veneer it. It doesn't make it make the times something else it isn't. That's propaganda. But great art reflects the actual moment of what's actually taking place. So anyway, I'll play the anthem video I do, um, but I hope all of you become truth, freedom and health warriors and become part of this community. I teach, uh, you know, we have many, many people teaching the class. We have a whole community we built. So I, I hope you um, join that and uh, become part of this movement. So let me play the anthem video and I'll be back to say goodnight. We have allowed our country to be taken over from within. And the end goal is you will have a homogenized world where we will become slaves because there is a condition among the elites that really thinks they're better than you, deep down inside them, that you don't deserve the freedoms you have. They don't. Okay. This reality is what people need to wake up to. And we need to all unite working people. There's only one movement that can do that. Mm -hmm. And that is the movement that we started creating here in Massachusetts, the movement for truth, freedom, and health. Look, I've been a student of politics since I was a four-year-old kid, studying revolutionary movements, left wing, right wing. There's a physics, there's a nuclear science to destroying the establishment. To build a bridge, you need to understand Newton's equation. You need to understand the laws of gravity. You need to understand Poisson's ratio. There is a way to build a revolution. And that's why I put this together. My goal is to train a army of truth, freedom, and health leaders. We don't need followers like social media, we need leaders, but they, they need training because the educational system does not teach them history, nothing. So in three hours, that's what I've started doing. That's the solution. Wow. We gotta train people. First with understanding what a system is. The second is understanding the interconnection between truth, freedom, and health. Freedom is the ability to move freely, communicate freely, right? Talk freely. Without freedom, you cannot 
convert ideas, hypothesis into truth, which is science. And without freedom, you can't really get to truth. And without truth, you make up fake problems and fake solutions, which means you destroy our health. And without health, which is the infrastructure of us and our body, you can't fight for freedom. Third concept is it has to be bottoms up, working people, people who work uniting. And what the right wing has done is whenever you say working people unite, that must be communist. Meanwhile, they've let the Democrats run unions, which suppress workers, completely corrupt. But when you look at the arc of American history, it's been when working people came up. We need to go local. Every solution I'm coming up with as a part of this movement, we're giving the science, which is the truth, and then we tell people what they can do on the ground. Like with election fraud, you don't need to wait for some lawyer. Our goal is to train people, Dave, to go local, to go local, to go local, fight locally. Forget lawyers, forget politicians, forget celebrities. You've got to learn politics, and there is a science to it. They lock us down, we should be ready to shut them down. And the fourth part of this principle is a not so obvious establishment. So when you look at a system, there's always something that disturbs you from getting to your goal. Well, the biggest disturbance is a not so obvious establishment, which are those people who claim they're for you on the left and the right. The Al Sharptons who tell black people I'm for you. The Tucker Carlson's. Do you think any true anti-establishment person will ever be on Fox or CNN? I don't think so. They both mislead working people back into the establishment without this solid understanding of political physics and theory, you're screwed. You're going to follow on the, the left wing, Bernie Sanders, oh, he said something, or Robert Kennedy, scumbags. Or you're going to follow, you know, some right wing talk show host. They're not going to lead us to liberation. It's us. And that political physics, it's a nuclear science of change. Bottoms up. We have to organize to understand that there is people who talk a good game and then look at what they actually do, left and right. I'm sorry, Sean Hannity may say some good things, but I don't see the urgency in his voice to get something done, and it can only come when you weaponize yourself with the right knowledge. You need to be able to identify a rat. You know, Christ didn't go after the Romans, right? It was the Pharisees and the Sadducees who screwed him up, his own quote-unquote people. And that's where we're at. So these four concepts I've built into a curriculum. People can go to bashiva.com, and it's an educational program. We need to train people in political theory. You need to have physics, and I've created that curriculum. People need to get educated. We need to get educated fast. And within a half an hour, an hour, I can teach people. Two years of MIT control systems, I teach people those concepts. Then I apply it, anyone can understand it. And then you say, oh, I gotta build a bottoms up movement. They have to get politically astute, and then they have to go locally and act, not sit there on social media. They have to act locally, defy locally, be, do civil obedience locally, but with knowledge on how to build a movement. And the Senate campaign's expanded to the movement for truth, freedom, and health, and they can find it on V as in Victor A. Shiva, vashiva.com, so people can sign in, they can get access to a bunch of videos. If they want to take a course and become a truth, freedom, and health leader, I offer a full scholarship there. But we want people to make a commitment that they'll study, that they'll get certified, that they'll go do activities on the ground. So go to VA Shiva, Victory America Shiva, VA Shiva.com. I also want to let everyone know that. Um, you can go to bashiva.com, but we've also made the book System and Revolution. Sometimes I read chapters from this. I think everyone will enjoy it. Uh, this will give you uh, a perspective, knowledge, engineering systems training, uh, everything. Uh, so you don't have to go to MIT, but it'll teach you this in a very accessible way. We've made the book absolutely free. You just cover shipping and handling um, and give it to a friend. Uh, we had, I think someone just ordered like 20 of them. But I think we it's, it's a best-selling book, but I thought uh, it would be best for all of you to have access to it. So get the book, but we really need to get millions of people educated on a systems approach. It's really the way out. Otherwise, we're all headed for disaster because we're going to be fighting against each other. And the elites just either want to put one set of people to sleep, which is through shows like this, so we don't see things as they are, so people don't build a bottoms-up movement, to really protect their interests. And that's where we're at today. And the only way we get there is by first refining our consciousness by taking a systems approach. 
And the systems approach is integrates the science of East and West, science and tradition, ancient and modern. So please take advantage of that. Uh, get the book, join the course. Uh, but most importantly, you'll be part of an incredible community of people that we've created that is not just a course, it's not just a technology, but it's a whole set of people. And we've created a platform that's independent of big tech. So when you sign up to the course, you get all the course material. But most importantly, you get access to a whole community of people. We do lots of activities online and offline. So please take advantage of that. So be well, have a good night. And uh, I hope this is valuable. And I hope it encourages you and inspires you to actually uh, get the knowledge of systems. So be well, have a good night.